So all that kind of took a little bit of time away from getting with you guys. But if you guys have any questions. Um, a notice about her concerns with um, Mark Perkian uh, speaking at the subcommittee meeting this morning, and why was he allowed to present even though he wasn't, he didn't have in, information on um, Florida's uh, refugee resettlement program? You know, I, I, uh, Leader Cruz sent me a letter, I want to say yesterday afternoon maybe, um, and I think she called me. Um, I was at home asleep already, but she had called me sometime in the evening, maybe around 9, 9 o'clock, um, and talked to me about their concerns. But I think that this is the situation. Is, you know, our job is to try to figure out how to maintain and protect the safety of Floridians. And so what we did is we put together a workshop, as we have done with Legislative University, as we've done with all of the stuff that we've presented to the members to try to give them as much knowledge as possible, because the knowledge is power. Um, and we want them to be armed with that. Uh, we try to make sure that what they're given is, is true and we present it in a, in a civil manner. And so we had a, a wide swath of presenters at a workshop in committee today, of which he was one who has uh, written a book on uh, immigration policy, uh, testified numerous times before Congress, um, uh, written extensively in, in uh, established periodical journals. Um, and had something that we thought added to the, to the debate on whether or not the current status of our refugee program and our participation in it is a way to protect Floridians. And as long as you have, if you watch the committee from beginning to end, situations where law enforcement officials do recognize that ISIS has uh, infected uh, their proponents and soldiers into the refugee movement and those soldiers are coming without any kind of scrutiny or, or coordination with FDLE and the federal government uh, into the state of Florida, what can we do as lawmakers to protect the people of the state of Florida? And that's what we had as a committee and, and I always say whether it's um, a Republican member, a Democratic member, that they represent 170 odd thousand people and they have the right to do what they think is best for their district and, and, I, and I've never challenged that and I wouldn't. But why about somebody whose organization has been linked to white nationalist groups who's been accused of, of saying racially insensitive things about immigrants and others before? And why even invite somebody like that? Well, well, first of all, I'd say that you'd have to go back through the history of time and show me a country that does not espouse the broadest breadth of freedom of speech um, is what is the determination of how free that country is. I think it was Nathan Sharansky who had said at some point that you can tell how free a society is or whether it's a dem democracy is when you can walk into the town square, uh, scream uh, hatred for those in charge and, and, and be allowed to do so. And so the way you fight speech that you don't like is with more free speech. And again, that's not me, I'm, I'm quoting Justice Brandeis. Um, that's how you uh, maintain freedom. That's how you ma maintain that power. And, and this is an individual who testified before Congress. He testified and was questioned by John Conyers. He was questioned by uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, Louis Gu Gutierrez. These are all congressmen with amazing records of advocacy for African Americans and Hispanics. They didn't choose to walk out. They didn't choose to uh, stage a press conference or turn it into a fundraising event. What they chose to do was use a gift of free speech that is very, very special to Americans to question him on his stances and his positions. I think that's the way you create a, a true democratic uh, uh, policy body that makes decisions that are in the best interest of the people. Mr. Speaker, what, was it uh, Chair Harrell's decision to invite him or you or someone in between? Ultimately, everything's approved through the Speaker's office. On tourism marketing, um, there's a Senate committee uh, where experts are testifying that taking money away from that could be risky. But what's your response? Well, I think we've given a lot of the statistics um, and the facts. So, uh, again, we're open to all those facts. Uh, the, you know, I think that what we ought to do as lawmakers is make decisions based on truth uh, and based on facts and not based on emotion or, or feelings. And so to the extent that they can give us a, a, a forensic um, belief that there is value to this, then we'll be open-minded to it and look at it. 
what we've had two issues with it, you know, three issues really from the get-go. One is a philosophical one. Do we need to be in the business of paying for the advertising of, in essence, Fortune, you know, 500 companies? Even if you get past that point, you say, okay, yes, there is, and there's some benefit. Um, prove that benefit. Is, it, is there really a return on investment? What is that return on investment and how do you measure it? And it was it ethereal data or anecdotal data or was it really causation data? Um, and look at that, look at it that from, and then the, the third point that we've raised is even if all of that were true, what was the rationale for jumping their budget from roughly 25 to 28 million dollars a year to 80 million dollars a year? Why all of a sudden in one area of governance do we have a, in essence, 200% jump in, in a budget, why don't we have that 200% jump in education funding? Why don't we have that 200% uh, jump in, in tax relief? Whatever it might be, that's probably more uh, beneficial to the people of the state of Florida. So all of those things are on the table, but we'll certainly look at, we're, we're more than willing to look at facts and make decisions based on uh, uh, indisputable data. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the governor's office has made several proposed ethics changes PCD, a bill that you're looking at putting together in the House, and they put those in writing, including, I want to ask specifically about his suggestion that there's undue influence in cases where a legislator who's an attorney works for a law firm that lobbies the legislature. He's saying that that's wrong and that should be changed. What is your response? Uh, I, I saw the letter. I just got it literally probably an hour before the conference. I'd say this, you know, I applaud the governor. I mean, I don't care that it takes year seven for him to come out with some ethics ideas. I'll take him in year eight. I'll take him in year seven. I think it's, a, it's an, a, something to be applauded. Um, I don't think anybody would argue that nobody has done more to restrain the behavior of legislators and rein in uh, relationships that, that are questionable between legislators and lobbyists and uh, legislators and special interests than the House has done on our own. Um, I think that's a good thing. On Tuesday, we had uh, Chairman Metz and the Public Integrity Ethics Committee pass out a six-year ban for legislators, that they couldn't have this revolving door between uh, legislators and, and then going out into governance. But we also applied it to um, cabinet heads. And, and part of the reason we applied it to cabinet heads, as you saw a day later, one day later you see, uh, or, or, or give or take, um, from the time that we noticed that committee meeting, you see an agency head who resigns, who has spent a hundred million dollars of taxpayer money on legal fees, go and immediately become one of the participants in that law firm that he gave millions of dollars in legal fees to. And so the bill that we also passed on Tuesday applied to cabinet heads. I, this wasn't, you know, I would tell Governor Scott, I haven't had the chance to speak to him personally, but I would tell him it was nothing against him. It was nothing against his cabinet head. It was trying to clean up the process of government. And, and, and to the extent that he has ideas um, that we can put into place and continue to move down that path and amend that bill, um, that bill has just had its first committee hearing. To the extent that he can help us and go over across the aisle to the Senate and encourage them to go down this path of reforming governance, uh, we're, we'll stand with them side by side. Um, you know, we have a couple criteria. We want to clean up government. We want to make it work for the people. But we also don't want to discourage um, honorable people uh, from running for office. And so to the extent that we can balance those um, criteria and create a product that, that's uh, honorable to the people of the state of Florida, we'll continue to do that every chance we get. And just a brief follow-up. What you just said, Mr. Speaker, about what happened with the Stevenson at the EEP. Is there any do you think that this, these proposed changes by the governor's office today are in any way, shape, or form retaliation for what happened with Stevenson? I, I always try to impute the best motives. I, I mean, I know Janet Cruz well. I've spent tons of time with Janet. Um, I know Keone McGee well. Um, I, I've spent tons of time with Governor Scott. Um, I know them all well enough to know that they all have uh, good hearts and good intentions. Do you have any question or doubt as to whether the, the fight Yeah, anytime we uh, can protect the right of Floridians um, and, and what that means to our economy, I think is a, is, a valuable, uh, is a valuable fight. I think it's a valuable fight to spend taxpayer money between branches who are encroaching upon the other branches in separation of powers fights. I think it's a valuable expenditure of taxpayer money to sue an entity that's saying that they don't have to disclose their contract for a million dollars of taxpayer money. I think those are all valuable. The question is, 
um, at what, what is that fair market cost. And so we've asked uh, Bill Hager, who's an expert witness and an attorney, uh, been in a, uh, elect, uh, elected to the highest levels in, in, a, in a previous state. I've asked David Richardson, who is a forensic auditor, to go through and look at those bills. And I think when you go through and you look at those bills, we're going to find really fast that defending the rights of Floridians, yes, it's an it's a absolute worthy expense. Spending $100 million in legal fees, uh, we are getting gouged and that needs to be fixed. Speaker, what's your take on the Senate's approach to issuing bonds to buy 60,000 acres south of Lake Ode and stop the flow of overflow of water going from the Coosahatchee and St. Lucie Rivers? I think uh, two, there's two points, Eric, that I would say. First is on the bonding front. I think as it stands right now, the House is not prepared to bond at all. I think that we've hit a, a, a level of bonding. Um, I think, again, I would applaud Governor Scott, who's done a great job in, in reducing our, our bonding percentage. And I think we're in a good position. Uh, second of all, it, it begs the question, the fact that you're bonding is because you're saying government needs more money for X. Um, I think that the House has also been very vocal about the fact that we do not need more money. We have a spending problem. And so I think what you're going to see us do is reduce spending, hopefully, by well over a billion dollars. Um, and, and with that, um, I think there's always going to be those opportunities to spend it on things that are, that are more wise or to give it back to the taxpayers. As far as I've had numerous conversations with Senator Negron, I think in my takeaway from my conversations with him, he has always said that purchasing land south of the lake is something that should be considered. What he's told me more than that was that, you know, as a Senate president who's from the affected area um, on the East Coast, that he would like to see us end blue-green algae in the state of Florida. Um, I've talked to other senators over there who are working on the same proposal with different ideas regarding Lake Okeechobee and, 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 and what fixing the dike would do. All of those things, I think, are bridgeable over the next 90 days. Um, is Lance out the lake part of the discussion? Sure, let's have that as part of the discussion. Is that the best way to achieve their goal of ending blue-green algae? Uh, maybe it's fixing the dike. I mean, I think those are things that are going to ferret itself out over the next 90 days. Um, and we, again, we'll look at all the evidence, all the data, and we're going to make decisions that are the best for the state of Florida uh, based on real data and real science. Sure. I don't know if you've seen the bill yet, but part of it calls for buying some of that land from U.S. Sugar. Uh, have you been able to weigh or develop an opinion on that yet, or is it too soon? Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't seen the legislation. So, sure. and we don't, and we definitely believe, and that's part of the reason why when we went through and we renamed our committees, we named it you know, agriculture and property rights. Um, I think, you know, I have uh, Leader Rodriguez and, and Speaker D. Oliva, we would tell you that, you know, property rights are fundamental to, again, just like freedom of speech, to the founding of a great society. Taking someone's property um, for the sake of taking someone's property is that the, there's not an appetite for that in the House. There's I can assure you that. There's nothing in the bill that, that requires the state to use its eminent domain powers to, tar to take property. It's, um, focus solely on willing seller. And if the willing seller provision isn't, um, if they can't find enough willing sellers, then they default to the option that the state exists, ha has right now, and that is to purchase the U.S. sugar property that it's already in, in contract, but still, the option still exists for several more years. Um, so is that, does that, do you see that still as taking? I, no, th uh, if that's what's in the bill. I just said I didn't, I didn't read the bill. Okay. Um, to the extent that I was asked whether I, that we would forcibly take or, or U.S. Sugar or anyone else's property for that matter, the answer is no. To the extent that it's any willing seller, again, to the extent that that is the solution that the science, that the forensics, that the evidence suggests and blue-green algae in the state of Florida, then certainly we'll give it a, a, fair, a fair hearing and a fair thought. That's, that's the, that, what is the goal? Is the goal just to buy someone's property? If that's the goal, I don't know why that's the goal. Well, I don't think anyone knows that if that's the goal. I think the goal is to try to end blue-green algae. How this came about was the fact that we had a tremendous amount of uh, rainfall that had us um, sending money uh, out of uh, Lake O that caused blue-green algae booms on the east and west coast. That's what needs to get fixed. And so we're gonna, th that's what we're going to set about as a goal to get fixed. And those are the conversations I've had with President Negron. Do you have any kind of opposition to, to buying land either for this proposal or elsewhere in Amendment 1? I think that um, all of the things that we do in that regard should be based upon us 
accomplishing something. So to the extent that we, the purchase of this land allows us to do this, that helps us with this, um, we'll look at it. Um, but I think right now that the land purchases that we're discussing have been discussed over the last six months by the Senate and most of the senators are, sur uh, are, are surrounding the fact that we had blue-green algae blooms um, and trying to fix that solution. And so that's what we're going to make our decisions on. Mr. Speaker, if I may, the uh, Senate passed its gaming bill yesterday. The first uh, committee passed it unanimously. Uh, today, I overheard a lobbyist talking in the hallway. I spoke to the speaker about the gaming bill. He's not going for this free, free for all. He also said he's going to let the Senate have their kitchen sink charade for now. Does that accurately sum up your feelings about what's going on in the Senate as regards to gaming right now? Uh, I, I, those aren't words that I would use. I probably would have used more profanity. But um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. The, uh, but no, I, I've seen the bill. Yeah, it's not where we're at. I, again, three things that we've said on that on a consistent basis. One is um, it has to be a contraction. Um, there was, there's, there's nothing in that bill that's a contraction. It's Senator a Senator Galvano insists it's all about contraction. Well, that, that's an interesting thought, and, and I'm sure we'll have that discussion. The, the, um, the second part is that we want longevity. Uh, we want some sort of, you know, we've looked at the constitutional amendment. The Senate has said to us they, they have no interest in a constitutional amendment that bans the expansion of gaming. I think for a state that's known as the family-friendly state, to the extent that we can wrap our hands around what the long-term picture and have an effect on what the long-term uh, picture of gaming in the state of Florida is and preserving our brand for decades is of great interest to the House. And the third thing is, on, on, as with any matter, the fact that we have courts who are encroaching upon our ability to make those decisions on a regular basis. Uh, now we have a, a federal court who's um, said that basically the, the, we uh, violated the compact and now they can do those for the next 15 years without any kind of legislative uh, revenues to the state or with any oversight. Uh, we have the Gretna case that stands before the Supreme Court. The last thing I think that benefits the people is for the courts to start writing law. Um, but that's what they're doing. And so to the extent that we can address those three things in a package, a, a drastic contraction, uh, including affecting uh, how the lottery is, is engaged in, in behavior, all gaming, all sources of gaming, um, that we could have a long-term solution that potentially could happen through the compact, and that uh, we could make that deci decision, the people who are closest, the representatives who are closest to the people and not seven judges sitting in, in private, I think that's a victory for the state. And so that's, we'll, we'll, we'll pursue it that way. Speaker Corcoran, um, I believe you mentioned the, uh, about a billion dollars in budget cuts that you um, want to do. Where do you anticipate that, that coming from? I mean, the two biggest areas are healthcare and education. I mean, are we anticipating, um, you know, foregoing per student funding increases that we've done in the last several years now, or perhaps even a decrease of them? No. Um, I think that uh, there's just tons of things that we do in the budget um, every year that have no longer, you know, what, ha what happens the way we do, because we don't do a zero-based budgeting, and so what we do is we take that budget that pre-existed, it's considered sacrosanct, and then we move and we look at the growth over that budget. That's pretty much how we've been budgeting. So what we've been doing under Chairman Trujillo and others has gone back and looked at a lot of that, including Senator Negron. Senator Negron has, has said the exact same, President Negron has said the exact same thing, is just because it was put in 20, 30 years ago doesn't mean that it shouldn't be re-examined and whether there's a, a still a purpose for that. And so when we've gone through that, um, I think that I feel confident that the House will be able to come up with a billion to two billion dollars worth of cuts. Um, and, and I think those cuts are, um, in many cases, um, projects um, could be cut. You'd be shocked how many projects, which is why we changed the rules. Why should a project, just because you're an appropriations chairman and you have power, or you're a rules chairman and you have power, you're a majority leader or a speaker, so now you have all this power and what you do on your exit is part of your legacy to the detriment of taxpayers, is you take this project that you haven't gotten, that you've put, put in the budget and you make it recurring and now it's in the base budget. So if you go through and you look at all the projects that have been put into place over the last 20 years that are now recurring and they're projects, um, that shouldn't be, you're in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Mr. Ju 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 just, just that in itself. Um, you know, we could, I could name uh, tons of areas um, that we could look at that, that I think that we're going to be able to find those savings. Do you think that those cuts are, are necessary to get to Governor Scott's $615 million uh, 
or how many million dollars, 600 and some odd million dollar? Uh, yes, package. absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that the governor's going to come out with his budget. So, so here's the deal. It, you know, the, the, the triumph money, I think, if, if you listen to Senate leaders and House leaders, we've all been very clear that that triumph money is going to go um, straight to triumph. All we're looking for is, is greater accountability uh, and oversight. Um, so you take that money off the table, $300 million. Uh, we're not raising property taxes. We've said that over and over. We will not raise taxes. The House is not going to raise taxes. We are never going to raise taxes. Um, that's $450 million. Uh, then if you look, start looking at the governor's package of $600 million, um, then you're going to have to account for that too. So, so the right there is you know, over a billion dollars. Uh, we're staring at a billion dollar shortfall for the next, the next budget year. So unless we put some additional money in reserves or additional money um, to compensate for the billion dollar shortfall, we'll be right back at it again next year looking at that. But, but yeah, um, to, to the extent that we do the tax cuts that the governor wants, I think, uh, I think we should get, you know, uh, you know, and honestly, for the most part, I, I've paid the small business rent tax on my law office when I had it. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a, it's a burden. It's a double taxation. And to the extent that we can get rid of it, um, I think it would be, and we're the only state out of 50 states that have it. So, so I think that says something. Under law office, and going back to the, to the letter, did, so I know what you said before about imputing the best um, motives, but you didn't see that as a direct shot at, at you and, and your, the work that you do for your, your law firm or perhaps with other members? I, I don't know what, you know, I, I, I read the letter and clearly they, they have somebody in mind, it seems like. I mean. I, you know, somebody suing somebody or, uh, you know, to the extent that we could find that out, maybe we could go ask that person as far as I'm concerned or not, to my knowledge, it's not me. But, um, but to the extent that we can, it doesn't matter. And if, and if that person is doing that and, and that's a questionable line of behavior and, and it's taking the process in a place that it shouldn't be to where it's more accountable and, and, and we're able to do great things of truth and justice for the people of the state of Florida, then have at it. Let's have that ethics reform. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't stop the revolving door from cabinet secretaries from going to law firms that they just gave million, million dollar contracts to. That's ridiculous. Nobody, I mean, I'd like them to find me the one person who says, hey, that's a great idea. Um, so we're going to continue to pursue all of it. We, we stand with them. I'll stand with the governor anytime, any place, anywhere regarding cleaning up government. Uh, sports and centers, is that a good thing? Um, I think there's a wide body of quotes <laughs> from any one, three of us, uh, with regards to the sport, sports incentives. Um, no, we, again, it goes back to that three. First of all, should we even be in that business? Second of all, do they work? Um, and there's been, comedians have done great videos. Um, now, you know, the great line of attack for these owners now is they come up with ideas and they call them, the or San Diego one, which failed in November, but they, they renamed it and called it a convadium because it's not a stadium, it's not, it's not a conference center, it's just like this massive joint everything center that the taxpayers get tremendous benefit from, and all of it's untrue. Can I ask you, again, just not about the Everglades and for saying the Everglades proposal, but just about conservation, like conservation easements. Do you favor increasing funding for that? No, you're asking the same question twice. You're, you're asking me is do I think that the state should take taxpayer money and just buy land? My response to you on all situations will be tell me the purpose for that land purchase and if that purchase is in line with what's beneficial to the state of Florida then we'll make that determination of whether the purchase first of all solves that solves that issue that we're trying to do to protect the people of the state of Florida and, and, and whether it's beneficial and that's the best use of our tax dollars in, that any, in any given session. I would rather, I, I, as much as I think that we've done tons of land purchases, to the extent that we've done land purchases that we cannot even maintain the property that we have, to the extent that we've done land purchases and we don't even know the land that we own because we've done so many, versus taking and taking that money and, and doing whatever it takes to get KIPP and SEED and all these low-income charters who can come in and take over failure factories, immediately open their doors and transform the lives of children as opposed to buying another three or four hundred million dollar piece of property and having it sit on the, sit on the books and not even be managed. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do ch uh, charter schools for low-income kids. Can you clarify your position on why you want the bonding, why bonding is such a problem? Every time you, you have voted for a transportation budget, you have supported bonding. Why now is bonding objectionable? Can you ex and explain 
explain no, I, how, you, how you all the, of a sudden reached well, that point? Th there's, no, there's no discrepancy on how you, the fact of the matter is you're a member of a 120 member body. Um, and throughout the process, and, and that's just in the House. And then, you're, then you negotiate with a 40 member body in the Senate. And so to the extent that you can push forward um, the most conservative agenda possible, um, and, and at the end of the day, look at that finished product and say, you know what, we move the needle on conservatives, conservatism and, and we were fiscally good stewards with the taxpayers' money, um, is what we pursue every single session. This session is kind of nice because we get to make that final decision. Um, we get to look at it and say, you know what, is this something that we need to be doing? And so if you look two years ago, um, Mary Ellen, the Senate was um, absolutely we're not bonding apart from the the federal trans tra uh, transportation part they weren't going to bond on pico in the first year and they weren't going to bond on uh, amendment one uh, the house was willing to have bond on amendment one two years ago and the house was willing to bond on pico then the second year uh, was a modified let's bond a little bit on pico but still nothing on amendment one this year you know the senate's 180 and now they want to bond on amendment one and the houses were not a bonding on one i mean that's part of the process but I will tell you, again, it goes to that fundamental premise. The reason you're bonding is so you can bring in more money to purchase more things on behalf of the taxpayers. I personally do not believe that government needs to be purchasing more things on behalf of the taxpayers. Mr. Speaker, you said that you want to... I'll take one, I'll take, I'll take one more question, and then, and I, unless Chairman Ali and Leader Rodriguez. I'm, I'm, I, I got your question. I'm all for tax cuts. I'm all for tax cuts. So does that no, no. I'm, you're, you're, again, confusing tax cuts with spending. I'm talking about, and, and not only spending, not only spending, I'll finish my time. Um, not only is it spending, um, it's spending on pork barrel projects is what I answered earlier. So what I said was that using your power and your influence to put in something into the budget that is pork barrel spending and then to make that thing recurring is what I've, I, I answered earlier to Gray, uh, Gray, that we would go back and look and cut. Tax cuts that are across the board, I don't care if it's the manufacturing tax. The manufacturing tax affected who? Manufacturers. I don't care if it's uh, an insurance premium tax that cut tax cut that affects the entire insurance industry. A tax cuts across the board that, that, that any individual is eligible to go get and participate and receive if they're in that, in that marketplace, I'm okay with that. Um, and I think the economists are okay with that. Um, and so yes, uh, when, it, when it comes to those things, um, I think you're absolutely confusing apples and oranges. But I appreciate it. If you guys uh, have anything, just get with Fred and we'll be glad to get back with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. then we'll be open-minded to it and look at it. What, we've had two issues with it, you know, three of them. I read the letter and clearly they, they have somebody in mind, it seems like. I mean, I, you know, and South Bay Lake is something that should be considered. What he's told me more than that was that, and we can allocate it to the poor, and certainly we'll give it a, a, fair, a fair hearing and a fair bond. But that's the job. What is the goal? Is the goal and if the willing seller provision isn't, um, if they can't find it. They, they have no interest in a constitutional amendment that bans the expansion of gaming. I think for a state that's known as the family-friendly state, to the extent that we can wrap our hands around what the long-term picture and helping kids. I'm going to answer that, Senator Jones. Why is the bonding? Why bonding? Because the House is not prepared to bond at all. I think that we've hit a, a, a level of bonding. We're, we're more than willing to look at facts and make decisions based on uh, uh, indisputable data. Speaker, the, uh, the governor's office says 